In today's True Crime Tutorial Tuesday video, I'm talking about Kelly Ann Bates whilst doing my makeup, so keep on watching to hear about her murder and see me create this makeup look. As many as the one in three women that are murdered each year is by the hands of a current or former lover. At a glance, the murder of Kelly Ann Bates may seem just to be another sad statistic. At the surface, her story is all too common, yet what sets this case apart from others is the manner in which she was killed and what has earned this case the title of the most horrific murder in England's history. Kellyanne Bates was born on the 18th of May 1978 in Hattersley, a small town in Tameside, 10 miles east of Manchester city centre. Parents Margaret and Tommy were thrilled to be gifted with a beautiful child. Her parents doted on her and encouraged her to be whoever she wanted to be and do whatever she wanted to do. As a result, she grew up to be a very confident, vivacious, mature teenager who often seemed to act far older than her actual age. Kelly was a kind and thoughtful teenager who had a strong relationship with both of her parents. While growing up, Kelly was a strong girl that loved playing sports. She dreamed of becoming a teacher and she attended college whilst working for a graphics firm. She had future plans and she had ambitions. Kelly met James whilst she was babysitting for one of his friends. Playing the perfect gentleman, he walked her home that night to keep her safe. The grooming process was so secretive that Kelly's parents didn't even meet James until two years later when they were finally introduced to the much older man. They had spoken to him on the phone but were completely oblivious to his age. They had become concerned immediately after the first introduction. How could they not? Kelly was just a teenage girl and James was a divorcee in his late 40s. Margaret recalled on first meeting that the hairs on her body instantly stood up. Even from that first moment, she sensed a dark evil behind his wicked eyes, but decided to give her mature, sensible daughter the freedom to make her own decisions. If only they had known how controlling and deceiving he really was. James was unemployed and divorced, living around the Gorton area of Manchester. His marriage ended in 1980 after 10 years due to being extremely abusive and violent towards his wife. 20-year-old Tina Watson would become his next girlfriend, who he had used as a punching bag for two years, going as far as inflicting severe beatings upon her while she was pregnant with his baby. That relationship ended in 1982 when Tina was able to escape his clutches during an attempt to drown her while she was taking a bath. James began then to groom 15-year-old Wendy Mattershead, who had also abused and attempted to drown her in the kitchen sink. And these are the accounts of women who have come forward. There's no way of knowing just how many women James abused and tortured before he met Kelly. In spite of her mother's attempts to keep Kelly away from James, shortly after introducing him to her parents, Kelly began spending more and more time at James's house. Although still worried about her daughter's relationship with this much older man, it seemed to Kelly's mother that James really did have Kelly's best interests at heart and would often phone her parents to discuss concerns he had about her. It wouldn't be long before that impression was shattered and the cycle of possessiveness and violence within the couple's relationship began. James, though, had a very strange way of showing his love. As Kelly started spending weekends at his home, they noticed that she was growing more withdrawn. She was no longer the vivacious, confident young woman they knew. Her world started and stopped with James. As she would return home from a weekend at his, he would call the Bates home with uncanny timing. Just as Kelly would be walking through the door, the phone would ring and James would be asking for Kelly. Then they would spend hours on the phone. James had to know where Kelly was at all times. If Kelly was waylaid on her way home, James would grow irritated. The couple argued often something Tommy and Margaret hoped would end their relationship. However, at the end of November in 1995, Kelly made an announcement. She was moved in with James. Margaret and Tommy were heartbroken. As soon as she moved in with him, Kelly was methodically ostracised from her family and friends. Slowly, Kelly stopped calling her parents or visiting their home. However, when they did see her, she would be wearing baggy dark clothing and would keep her head down. When she would look up, or if her sleeves pulled up, her parents noticed bruises. During one visit, Margaret noted that the entire side of Kelly's face was black and blue. 
Kelly always had excuses ready, excuses her parents did not believe for a single moment. Then Kelly stopped visiting or calling altogether. In December of 1995, she quit her part-time job and no one really heard much from her again. When the birthday and Christmas cards were signed by James and not Kelly, her family became increasingly concerned for her well-being and contacted their doctor and the police. However, Kelly was never checked up on by either due to the fact that she was now a legal adult. On the 16th of April 1996, James walked out of his local police station to report Kelly's accidental death. He told them that she inhaled water whilst bathing in the bathtub during an argument and died accidentally. He stated that he tried to resuscitate her but was unsuccessful. He was also sure to tell them that his girlfriend was known to pretend to be unconscious, which is why he hadn't noticed that she had drowned. Officers quickly made their way to his property, where they found Kelly's lifeless body naked in the bedroom, but it instantly became clear that James's tale was just that, a tale. On discovering Kelly's body, there was no uncertainty as to her boyfriend's crimes. Kelly had succumbed to a death so violent and painful, she was almost unrecognisable. Her naked body was found in the bedroom and her blood was found all throughout the home. She was taken for autopsy, where over 150 separate injuries were found all over her body. These included scarred into her buttocks and left leg, burns on her thigh caused by the application of a hot iron, a fractured arm, multiple stab wounds caused by knives, forks and scissors, stab wounds inside her mouth, crush injuries to both hands, mutilation of her ears, nose, eyebrows, mouth, lips and genitalia, wounds caused by a spade and pruning shears. Both of her eyes were gouged out. Later, stab wounds to the empty eye sockets and partial scalping. The autopsy also noted that Kelly had been starved, losing close to 20 kilograms, which is 44 pounds. She also been severely dehydrated and her official course of death was noted as drowning following being beaten about the head. For four whole weeks, she had been kept bound, tied up to a radiator and furniture by her hair and sometimes she'd been tied up by her neck. Kelly had been burnt with cigarettes and branded on the thigh with a hot iron. Boiling hot water had been poured over her feet and her buttocks. She had multiple stab wounds caused by knives, forks and scissors. Stab wounds were found on the inside of her mouth. A ligature mark on her neck indicated she had been strangled and at some point during the four weeks her hands and kneecaps had been crushed, rendering her unable to walk and therefore escape. She had been partially scalped, her ears, nose, mouth, lips and genitalia had been mutilated. Both of her eyes had been gouged out and her empty eye sockets had been stabbed. It was determined that Kelly could have been blinded up to three weeks before finally perishing, which that is just an awful thought that's another added layer of torture, you know, taking one of her senses, her sight away from her, just absolutely despicable. Kelly's father, Tommy, had the grim task of identifying his daughter's body. When James was taken into custody, he denied murdering Kelly. He claimed that it was accidental, that Kelly had goaded him into doing it. James claimed that Kelly would taunt him about his dead mother and would dare him to hurt her. He also claimed that Kelly would injure herself to make it look worse for him. When he was asked why he had brutally tortured her the way he did, he said that she had dared him to do it and challenged him to do her harm. Which obviously is a load of rubbish and um, clearly she wouldn't be wanting any of the harm done to her but she was too deep into being able to escape him. A consultant psychiatrist, Gillian Meze, told the court that James had a severe paranoid disorder and morbid jealousy and lived in a distorted reality. James may have successfully manipulated Kelly and the women before him, but the jury were able to see through his lies. It took them only one hour to convict him of the murder of Kelly and to sentence James to a minimum of 20 years in prison. Which, obviously now it's been over 20 years since um, he was sentenced, I haven't been able to find anything saying that he has been released, so I'm taking that he is still behind bars where he belongs. 
for the first time, the jury, defence attorneys and prosecuting attorneys, as well as the judge, were all provided with professional counselling after reviewing the horrific details of the case. Of course, there's no amount of time that will ever ease the pain and the trauma for Kelly's family, but there is some relief in knowing that their daughter's death put a stop to a monster whose abuse ruined the lives of multiple young women. This case has been the subject of one episode of Britain's Darkest Taboos. So guys, that is everything I have for this case, everything for today's video. I hope you guys have all enjoyed and I will see you all in the next one.